Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. With me today is John Gepfert, CEO of American Extractions. And we have a bit of a treat today because we were actually able to go live down to Gepfert's facility in Janesville, Wisconsin. He does whole spectrum extraction, which is completely new and gets 100% of the entire plant. Everything that's in the plant comes out of the plant. You really got to listen to it. Anyway, before we get started, please make sure to, I can't stress enough how much you got to listen to this. No. <laughs> before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com. Now, here's my interview with John Gepard, CEO of American Extractions. Uh, all right. So I always like to start out by asking a little bit about what brought you to the cannabis industry. So, you know, how did you find yourself where you are today? We, we started, we have a couple of businesses, but we started doing molecular extractions um, of organic compounds going back maybe 2010-ish. Um, we were pulling salicin out, which is the building block for aspirin, for the aspirin guys. And we had come up with a process for extraction um, that was really thermal cycling uh, back at that point in time where we were getting 50 or 60% more of the active ingredient out of the raw material than an industry that was 600 years old could do. Right. Um, and before that, so are you an engineer by trade or you know a machine builder? How does that work? I, I'm not an engineer by trade, no, uh, but I, I come from a long line of, of scientists. Uh, my father was a rocket scientist, uh, designed the first operational ramjet uh, missile in the world. In fact, uh, it's still being used, but it was used to shoot down the first MiGs uh, in Vietnam uh, ever, so. So, I mean, like a true STEM family. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, so when did American Extractions uh, officially uh, start? I had mentioned earlier that uh, in a conversation that time sense is horrid. Um, you know, I'm a project driven guy, right? A problem driven guy. And if you ask me how long I've been doing this, I would really probably have to think about it. But American Extractions, I think, uh, officially um, came to being maybe three years ago. Uh, the parent company is Simply Solutions. And that goes all the way back to 2007, eight. And don't worry about that. I'm terrible with times and names, you know? <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, it's, I mean, unless it's immediate family, you know, I'm just gonna make sure I have yours in front of me at all. Time. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is it about American extractions and your specific process that sets you apart from the competition? I mean, uh, what I've heard is that one of the top features is efficiency. Yeah, absolutely, it's efficiency. Uh, I had been using thermal cycling to do molecular extractions. And the advantage is there's no chemistry involved, and that's a good thing. Um, in any time you extract materials, there's unintended consequences. What other compounds I'm using, if I'm using chemistry to do this, get left behind in the raw material. You can't remove those fingerprints. And I think that's just a, uh, that's an antiquated approach, right? Most of the processes for extraction that are being used go back to the Greeks. So, I mean, it's just, it's old. And while it works, it doesn't work necessarily well. So what I was looking for is a process that was cleaner and more efficient. That's, so that's what started us on the path. We, we worked into thermal cyclings, uh, and that was clean, and it was efficient, but it was too slow. What is thermal cycling? Th thermal cycling uh, would be taking whatever biomass I am trying to extract from and use temperature to weaken the cell walls to allow extraction to occur more thoroughly. Okay, and when it comes to efficiency, now we've heard numbers of in the hemp business, what is it like getting 50 to 60% out of the plants, maybe up to 70% of the plants in cannabis, but is it true that you're getting 99%? Yeah, no, honestly, we're getting 100%, and I know wow. all of these guys. Now, I can't deliver 100% to you because our process throws, uh, flows through tubing. And as an example, some of that material is left behind. It's on the tubing. So it is, or it's stuck on the, on the inside of the vat, you know. So the, that 1% was extracted, it's just left behind. Okay. Um, so yeah, and we've got great tests to prove it. Uh, 
we're a science-based company. Uh, we're a biotech company, right? We can deploy this technology into extracting any compound from any biological material with the same kind of efficiencies. So why is that important for the cannabis industry? Well, it's important actually for cannabis in particular. We know the entourage effect is a real thing. We don't know in what percentages, what other minor cannabinoids need to be present in order to optimize the effect of the primary cannabinoids. The research isn't there yet. What I do know is God was pretty smart when he created a lot of this. So in my mind, until we have conclusive studies done, extracting the cannabinoids out in the same ratios that they were when the plant grew is likely to be the most effective uh, method right now uh, to get those desired effects, right? To be consistent in those desired effects. Okay, and this type of extract is uh, marketed as whole spectrum, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so what, what does that mean? Well, uh, as an example, I can point back, I think it was 2017, I had a chromatogram. Uh, we ran our uh, distillate through uh, a mass spec. And uh, I got really good results here of what was there. There were 16 peaks that consistently showed up in between the known cannabinoids. That means they have the same mass, they have the same boiling point as every cannabinoid there. Mm -hmm. They're cannabinoids. Right. They're cannabinoids that have never been seen before. And the reason you can see them in our material is because of that extraction efficiency. Mm -hmm. They may be present in other extractions, but you'll never know it because of all the garbage that's in there with it, right? It, 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 it obscures it like fog from the machine's ability to delineate it. I had circled six of these in particular, and that very first one was CBT. So it was in our tinctures long before it was discovered. So when they say whole spectrum, it's everything known and unknown that was in that plant at the time of harvest. So what is some of that uh, garbage that you're talking about? Well, so, I mean, you can have waxes in particular. You know, most distillates that you see that pour like honey aren't good, clean distillates. It is what the world thinks is a good, clean distillate. Oil does not pour or string, right? Um, if it's pouring and stringing, there's something other than oil there, right? And it's that that will obscure those other cannabinoids. On top of the fact, if, if I'm using chemistry to extract, which is how the majority of extractions are done, those extraction chemicals don't equally extract every cannabinoid. Some are better on some than others. If I'm only gonna get 50% out, of the large volume of cannabinoids, what happens when I have trace cannabinoids? Mm -hmm. I won't get any of them. Right? So, so you're seeing 16 sort of unknown cannabinoids? 16 peaks, yeah. Okay, that's, I mean, that's incredible. Like, so for me, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that. Is it difficult when you're trying to go to market in the cannabis and hemp industry and kind of explain what your differentiator is? It is, because there's a lot of pseudoscience. Science is a dangerous thing. We, I think we all learned it in COVID, right? Pretty soon you don't know who to believe. Um, in, in this particular case, there's a lot of science that is used inappropriately or terms used inappropriately, or just a lack of knowledge of molecular extractions. So what we're trying to do is bring that real science, that hard cutting edge uh, to the organic world, because there is real value in lots of plants, hemp and marijuana included. What, uh, so what are some of these terms that are used inappropriately? Uh, well, um, they're, they're uh, um, nano particulate. I'll start there, okay? They'll say, hey, we're nano. And if you go to the websites of a lot of these companies, no, they're not. What they're conflating is nano and water solubility. All right, now water's nano, all right? Nano being described as anything from one nanometer to 100 nanometers in physical size. Um, what we understand is small particles can act like greater concentrations because of their small size. Uh, the pharmaceutical world has known this for a long time and has tried to make nano medicines, but the mistake I think they have made all along is they're trying to use chemistry to solve a physics problem. They just don't realize it yet, right? You ask a chemist how to do something, there will be a solution involving chemistry, right? Right, right. So if we talk about nanoparticulates, you know, CBD is 2,000 nanometers as God makes it, give or take, 
All right, sometimes there's more carbon available, sometimes, excuse me, there's less. Um, our process, we deploy 16 million joules of energy. I, it's proprietary, I can't tell you how the energy is expressed into a space. We open up those cell walls and we remove the material. In doing that, we're gonna get everything out, okay? Um, the intended purpose of doing it this way, I never understood why we left 60% of the gold in the ground. Right, right. All right, it made no sense to me. And then I realized it's because the extraction chemicals we're using don't scale, not well, and they leave fingerprints behind. So clearly the answer was we need a solution that isn't a chemistry-based solution. I want a physics or a molecular mass-based solution. Physics is cool because it scales evenly always. Chemistry does not, right? I love the meatloaf you made last week. Make me one that's 600 pounds that tastes the same. Oh, I like that challenge. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I understand. Like, uh, so when did you identify this problem in the industry and then start developing a machine? So we, I, I actually had a friend who had sold a business and we were doing molecular extractions. He calls me. He's in the, the pot and uh, hemp world. And he goes, can you extract uh, hemp, uh, CBD from hemp? And I went, yeah, I'm sure we can. Let me look at it. So by experiment, I think it was seven, we were getting 100% of the available cannabinoids that were in the plant out. The idea was let's, let's maximize efficiency. And along with efficiency of extraction, there's efficiency of time. Uh, we can extract 100% of those available cannabinoids in less than an hour from let's say 80 kilograms of material. Um, so it, it, it starts to compound itself because the process is much quicker, there's no chemistry involved, and it's much more efficient. On top of the fact that you're getting everything out. Yeah. You know, and there's lots of good stuff in hemp too. I mean, there's lots of omega vitamins, right? So those omega three, six, and nines that are good for your heart and your brain, yeah. they're also present. Yeah. We get all of those out as well. So it becomes um, a good mixture of materials that we know are good for us. You know? What I don't understand is why no one's attempted to do this before. Why? I mean, was it just complacency where they're like 50 to 60, 70% is good enough? or lack of innovation, or if you, if you ask extractors how to extract, they will tell you what they understand. Most innovations that occur in industries do not occur from inside that industry. It comes from outside the industry. As human beings, we follow paths. You don't believe me, go look in the woods. <laughs> you, know, you know, people walk down the same trail and we do that uh, logically as well, right? This is why extraction methods, ethanol extraction was pioneered by the Greeks. Right? You have people like Plato and those guys writing about it. That's a long time to continue to do the same thing. But if it works, and it's easy, we're lazy that way. We don't look for solutions, right? Was it, when your friend came to you with this issue, was it the challenge that you found the most exciting? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I really, I, I like it when people say it can't be done, because what we're doing here, there have been extraction experts that have been in this business a long time, came out, big articles written, that this doesn't, can't work, mm -hmm. but it does. And, and they always say that. It's like, why, why didn't somebody else think of it? Well, there's always the first guy through the door, right? Um, I mean, why weren't there cell phones in the 1800s? You know, <laughs> it, you know or just pick any technology you're looking for. Seat belts, something simple, right? Not added to cars. Um, it isn't until the first guy walks through and says, hey, maybe there's a better way. Have you had any pushback or issues as a result of being the first people through the door? It's hard to, a lot of times what people understand may not be true. Okay. And when you have to go to somebody and say, that's not true, nobody likes being wrong. Yeah. And, and so there is some explaining to do sometimes, anytime that new technology comes in, something uh, or a process that's more efficient and just smarter across the board. One of the things that was interesting, and we're learning about this process as we go, because uh, there's nobody to call. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That's actually some of the fun and a lot of the consternation, right? If something isn't working, figure it out. You know, then, then you gotta, I have to channel my father because that, that's those lessons that were, you know, he taught us growing up, there's nothing you can't do. It just depends on the amount of energy you're willing to put into it. And that actually works on a philosophical as well as a physics level. <laughs> uh -huh. When you were talking earlier about the entourage effect, um, how can you, how can you, is there a way to value your entourage effect based off of your extractions from others? Or is it sort of just right now sort of this uh, um, kind of term that's used but not really well understood? 
everything you just said was true. So, so if we look at it, we don't understand what compounds in what concentrations are necessary to solve whatever problem we're looking at. The data isn't there. What we do know, if we back up to that 100,000 foot view, is more is better and that works, all right? And so that's a good method to start with. What, what we did was we first worked at how do I become an efficient extractor that does no harm later? Like we have lots of diseases that I think of right now when I was a kid, I didn't know anybody that was autistic. All right, now it's an ep epidemic level. Well, why? How did that happen in 15 years? It wasn't like an autistic comet hit the planet and dispersed something. This is probably a buildup of tolerances, going to the engineering side, where we are dosing, micro-dosing ourselves with compounds that aren't particularly good for us for 20 years, 30 years. Right. And there's DNA damage done because of that. So I thought maybe the best way to avoid that is to skip the chemistry altogether, and I don't even have to walk into that space. On top of the fact that we can be an efficient extractor, the unintended consequences of the science that was really interesting is in delivering all this energy into the space, we are fundamentally changing those cannabinoids in that we're ionizing them. Our distillate, when it first came out, started coming out was really orange. I mean orange. It's not supposed to be orange. Why is it orange? It shouldn't be orange, right? It's supposed to be yellow. And it dawned on me, uh, particle physics is one of my passions, it dawned on me that things are the color they are based on their polar charges. Polar charge changes are expressed in color changes or color shifts first, from yellow to orange to blue to purple. Son of a gun. Uh, you know, my father told me as a young man, if you pay attention to what you're doing, it's telling you everything you need to know if you just listen and watch. And we don't. So about two weeks in, I'm like, oh shit, here's what's happening. This is an ionization process, right? We've sheared electrons free, likely from the oxygen, excuse me, the oxygen molecules. Um, in ionizing it, it becomes more bioavailable because of that charge change, the polar charge change. I then noticed as we were looking at it, like you could rub it on your skin, and within seven, I have arthritis in my thumb pretty bad. Within seven or 10 seconds, the arthritic burning would stop, which is way too fast. God was smart when he made skin. Keeps the outside out, the inside in. The only way through it is with a needle for most parts, right? So how is this possible? Well, the only explanation would be the particulates are nano in size because that's the only thing that can make it through our skin. But CBD isn't nano. So how is that possible, right? Well, our CBD has to be for this to be happening. So we sent it to the University of Washington. They got a brand new scanning electron microscope. I had done some calculations based on the proposed polar charges, and I had calculated we were at about 30 nanometers in physical size. That answered all of the things that I was seeing. Uh, they came back to us, and I think we were at 28.8 nanometers. Oh, man. Yeah, it was, it was a good guess. <laughs> um, he, did see, he did see some particles even down into the single digits, but the resolution, of, we, they only have 25,000 uh, magnification, 25,000 X. Okay. And he said, I couldn't clearly see you could have pico particles too, but the concentration was really here. Wow. How do nanoparticles, true nanoparticles matter? National Institute of Health has got maybe, I don't know, 600 pages on it, right? The pharmaceutical world has known this. Smaller particles get into you faster and linger longer, right? Your liver doesn't filter nanoparticles out. Uh, CBD and most of these cannabinoids, CBD in particular, as God makes it, is 2,000 nanometers. And if you look at it, it looks like a cluster of cotton balls, okay? And the reason they cluster like that is polar charges. An example is if you take a, a magnet and I stick it into a, a bowl of paper clips, it doesn't pick up every paper clip. It picks up however much you know, the charge can handle. Right. By us changing the polar charge, that means ours can exist in smaller standalone colonies rather than big clumps. Okay. Uh, I want to stick on the nano size a little bit more because sure. so by breaking the CBD molecules down to a nano size, uh, you're not breaking them down. Okay, you're you're keeping them from clustering together. Yeah. You're right? releasing them. Right. Yeah. Rather than rather than twenty of your friends in a group, right? There's three. Yeah. And they're now not 1,000 pounds, they're now 200. Okay. That's what's happened. Okay. Uh, man, 20, 20 friends in a room. I mean, it's post-COVID, but not that good. <laughs> no. um, so 
Is anyone else doing this in the industry at that like sort of nano size? I know that you were kind of, were you talking about like people that are talking about doing nano emulsions and stuff like that? Yeah, so again, they're conflating water solubility with a, something that isn't nano. Yeah. I mean, it, it, realistically, to make an emulsion, I have to put something on the oil mm -hmm. to make it want to bond to the water. Right. So I'm going to have to add mass to the CBD in the form of other compounds. I'm actually making the particle bigger by emulsifying it. Okay. Right? Right. So you're the only ones doing this, and it's, uh, is it marketed as a nano ionized CBD? It is. Or THC? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, so now we, we only paid to have the CBD looked at. Okay. Um, what I will tell you is all of the molecules are going through the same forces. They're going to be the same or similar sizes, if, especially if we looked at THC. THC and CBD are twins. Right? They're absolutely identical to each other other than the placement of some of the molecules right? that build them up. Same ones. So uh, we're going to have a nanoparticulate THC. There's going to be a nanoparticulate. In fact, I'm, I'm reasonably sure we could put any compounds in here and end up with a similar result. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how many patents do you have just on this sort of extraction technology? So this technology, I, we have a, a number of patents, uh, but on the technology itself, we've chosen to keep it a trade secret. Oh, okay. Uh, primarily because the rest of the world, China, mm -hmm. does not honor our patent system. And the patent system is about learning and progressing knowledge, right? And in exchange for you teaching me how to do whatever you came up with, I'll give you a seven years head start, right? Right. Well, China goes, thanks. <laughs> and now they're competing with me with my idea. Right. So I chose a, a Parker Pen, the guys that make uh, the first pressurized ballpoint. I took their approach. They kept a secret on how to make the ball inside to this day. So it didn't last seven years. It lasted 40, 50, 60. I, I'm not even sure what the number is now. Okay. So... It's not like uh, you're manufacturing a product that people in the industry can buy. Uh, basically, they're coming to you to use your services. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and how do, you, how do you find your customers? Are they finding you via, via word of mouth or are you getting out there? How does that sort of uh, connection happen? So we, we started this process with an idea. So two and a half years ago, I had made bench, tops ver bench top versions of what came to be known as George. George is the machine itself. Okay. Um, it's just easier to call him George. Yeah, is George um, your dad's name? Yeah, no, it was not. <laughs> George is his name I'll remember. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dirty! <laughs> oh, right on. So, um, I, we, I, I, you, you, you attracted me there. No, no worries. Uh, so, um, tell me more about George. So we we developed we developed George in order to first and foremost uh, increase efficiency. And then the tag-alongs that came behind this were the nanoparticulates and the ionized charge changes. There, there was one other thing that started to happen. There's pictures of it here. Mm -hmm. During distillation, so our, our crude, you can pump. It pours like Coca-Cola. Okay. All right? Yeah. Because of this process, it's exceptionally clean. And we don't have to heat and, and put it through all kinds of weirdness, right? Never gets over 70 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in, its, in its journey. Um, what we started seeing was nucleating of the distillate. So the distillate comes out of one of the stills, and, it, and it's an oil, and it's orange. And uh, you hold it up to the light, and as you're holding it, you will start seeing these little points of light forming inside. Little crystalline structures, first the size of pinheads. And I mean, this starts to happen in, in minutes. And within four or five minutes, there are tons of crystals that have eluded themselves from solution and fallen to the bottom. Um, so what we have is the world's first all-natural isolate. Mm -hmm. And it happens without chemistry because of that polar charge change. If we remove the fats, fats keep, CBD wants to be a solid, all right? As long as there's fats present, it'll stay a liquid. If the fats are gone, it's like, I'm out. <laughs> you know, yeah. what's, what's amazing is that stuff is 90, it's 100% cannabinoid, mm -hmm. not 99 like normal isol isolate. It's 99% uh, CBD and then uh, CBC and then sometimes CBDV, small amounts okay. uh, are deposited. And with crystalline structures to form this quickly is super unusual. A lot of times as it's pouring out, the crystals will be forming on the nozzles, making it difficult to move, you know. Um, but the sharper and pointier a crystal is, the purer it is. Okay. 
Okay. Because it's going to remain proprietary and going to remain in-house, are you going to have difficulty scaling uh, quickly? I mean, I got to imagine that, you know, once these products sort of started getting out in the industry, that you're going to see a spike in demand. George is crazy efficient. Okay. Um, he, was the least, he was the least expensive machine in the building to build. No. Oh. Um, he has to run an hour mm -hmm. to keep the rest of the stuff busy for eight. Oh, okay. So as far as making crude goes, it's really simple. George can really shove it out. It just means the line behind it that cleans it, you build another one just like it. Right? right. right? One George can handle three lines. George just sounds too good to be true. George has turned out to be a, a winner, and, and he works a lot harder than we initially thought. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, you know, what are the plans for uh, more Georges? Yeah, so we've, we've been approached by other industries uh, to remove specific molecules, and one of them was in um, uh, the, the chokeberry. There's anthocyanins in it that are polyphenols that are in red wine. You know, the red wine you're supposed to drink, it's good for your heart, it's good for your head. Yeah. It is actually the red color. That is the anthocyanin. Oh, okay. We took product that had been pressed already, and they take the juice and then they use it, um, that he would throw away. And we got 800 times more anthocyanins out of his waste material than he got in the original pressing. Whoa. So George can deliver, and what's cool about George is he doesn't care if you're water-soluble, you're fat-soluble. It, apl it applies evenly across the board to all those compounds. Well, I mean, for sort of like uh, an inquisitive mind like your own, how do you not just like pick everything you see, throw it in George, and see what comes out? <laughs> yeah, so y you do do that, except you know, along the way we've made changes. George is maybe the star but the way we fractionate is different than the rest of the world does. The way we decarb is different than the way the rest of the world does. Okay. Um, so there was an awful lot to learn and figure out and then build. And then once it was built, uh, this was, I don't know, maybe six months ago, I went, you know what, this can do better. Like, this can be fine-tuned yet. And so we did, and we just finished this week. So if you consider that two years ago or three years ago, it was on a bench top and people said you can't do it, and now it's completely scaled and churning out amazing products. That's a lot of ground in short time, you know, for a little guy in Wisconsin. Right. And uh, um, I guess we should have said that you're in Janesville, Wisconsin. You know, we're here in person because you're just down the road from us. Um, but and so George isn't the only uh, machine that you have in house, right? You right. guys do a lot of what are some of the other machines and, uh, you know, services that you offer to both the uh, cannabis and hemp space? So that, you know, that's one of the things that's interesting. Um, we have chromatography, right? Because there isn't a good way to separate molecules. There is. We have another process that we're working on, which would be completely chemical free, um, that we will maybe embark on this fall, where we can separate cannabinoids without chemistry. And in, in early tests, it's worked really well, which is another physical process. But one of the advantages, you can make tea-free products without any petroleum distillates being involved. Okay. So for those people that are interested in having a tea-free, unadulterated product where no uh, petroleum distillates have touched it, it's the only way you can do it. I mean, it's the only thing possible. What do you mean by tea-free? Uh, THC-free. So let's say, so you're a truck driver, I'm a police officer, and, and I'm interested in my health. So right now I have to use a petroleum distillate in order to separate these. And no matter what you do, there's fingerprints left behind on a molecular level. Okay, okay. Um, so I had read a story uh, from a couple years back that you said processing was the biggest choke point for the future growth of hemp and cannabis. Is it still the biggest choke point? If we apply what we understand in other manufacturing, yeah. absolutely. Um, because of efficiency is what's how large business, small business becomes large business. And you cannot scale with the efficiencies of 50%. You can't, right? Or 60%. Uh, and there's not many that can do better than that. If they're telling you that, it's wishful. Okay. So of the whole spectrum products that you've seen marketed um, using your process, do you have a favorite? 
you know what's interesting? So biology wasn't my gig, right? Physics is. So tell me what you want. I will go get it, <laughs> right? Um, there have been a couple of our customers that have paired some really interesting organic oils that I have never looked at uh, that are really useful. I was, and actually I was surprised um, that the fundamental building blocks of some of those are so much better, so much healthier. They will aid in delivering the CBD into your bloodstream. Wow, that's, I mean, that sounds incredible. It is, so I mean, science can point to an awful lot of things and we can take the limited knowledge we have and we can make the products we have more likely to be successful in the end user. Uh, you know, uh, Wisconsin is still a prohibited state. Yes. Um, you know, does that impact your business? Um, and if so, how? So, I mean, from 100,000 feet, it makes little sense. All right, I mean, so my wife had a back injury. She'd been on Oxycontin and fentanyl patches for 30 years and, and it changed her, right? So if I go back to last April, a year ago in April, I went, we're done with this. We're, we're gonna stop this. So we worked with our pain doctor. We, we started making tablets. So that was the reason I did it. Um, I wanted to have good solid dosing. And the way to do that is to take the, uh, the distillate, turn it into a powder, compress it, so I can make sure I'm getting the same dose at the same time always. And as of 90 days after that, she was off the Oxycontin. She's the first patient this doctor's ever had off fentanyl. Oh, wow. And she goes, you know, I feel better. And tramadol. So she doesn't have to take a muscle relaxant either. We matched her dosage to the similar dosage of Oxycontin in milligrams. And the results were really similar. I mean, it does show you how powerful CBD is, in particular, if it's ionized. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, that's an incredible story. That, honestly, that's what brought me to this industry too, is seeing people that were getting off of traditional medications on comparatively very little. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, was, I, I was shocked that at, at our state level, uh, I'm a pretty conservative guy overall, right? But I'm also I'm not foolish. If Oxycontin is legal, how is marijuana not? Yeah. I mean, it makes, if you compare the destruction and damage physically the one can do versus the other, I mean, it, it makes no sense. And the amount of pain relief or anxiety relief, those are the number one and two drugs, which is probably one of the reasons why this has been slowed down nationwide. Yeah. You know, big pharmaceutical companies don't get to make money if I can make it in my backyard or I grow it in my backyard, right? It's not good for business. Right. Oh, uh, do you have an expectation for legalization either in Wisconsin or on a federal level? Yeah, so the, the federal government doesn't seem to be able to do anything regardless of what's going on, so that, that probably doesn't happen. Yeah. At a state level, it can be different. And, and I tell you, the tide has changed, mm -hmm. and it's changed on both sides. You know? and, and I think if they start thinking about what would be best for the population, I mean, there's a bunch of ways to look at this. I know we can relieve people's pain, like my wife's. Right? That's a pretty cool reason to get up each day, right? Yeah. And I can do it in a way that's not addictive and it doesn't screw up body chemistry. Seems like a smart move, right? Yeah. So we can make people feel better. I can collect a whole bunch of tax money. Like, so if I'm a politician and, I, and then helping people doesn't matter, because mm -hmm. I don't care, maybe a huge windfall of tax money that will fund all my pet projects would be something that would be useful. Yeah. And if that doesn't do it for you, maybe the fact that farmers here now in Wisconsin, right, who can grow anything better than anybody else in the country could have at this. So, I mean, this, how do you lose on that deal? Yeah, that was another turning point for me. Uh, first, it was family members using it uh, to their benefit. And then the other was I come from a family of farmers. And uh, when they started coming to me saying, so tell, what do you know about growing hemp? And I was like, pardon? Like, <laughs> you know, it kind of blew my mind. And they're just like, what do you know about growing like uh, cannabis? I'm like, that is just, I mean, normally it's like a soybean sort of conversation. Right. So the yeah, fact alfalfa, that there is, right? <laughs> yeah, any sort of interest in that is where I was like, okay, it's really starting to turn in Wisconsin. And I mean, anytime that we've seen the numbers, it seems like it's, you know, in, universally accepted. Yeah. Or not universally. Sorry, that's not a term that you can accept. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, the majority of people. You can't hide stuff forever. Right. right? Sooner or later. It, it finds a way to get out. I, uh, I was not a hemp CBD marijuana guy at all, right? In fact, I had come up with this process. We started making stuff. I'd never used it. Tell me the molecule you want. I'll go get it, yeah. all right? And I'll do it cleanly as to not hurt you, all right? That was my mission, right? 
I'm in there, I have arthritis in the thumb bad. I've been taking tremendous amounts of ibuprofen, 3,000 milligrams a day, not good for my liver, and it wasn't helping. I mean, it didn't do anything. So I'm in the lab and I'm like, I should try some of our CBD, you know? So I take 100 milligrams, and within 15 minutes, I have no pain in my thumb. And what was wild is as a scientist, my first thought was, well, the ibuprofen must have kicked in after 90 days. It had just needed a 90 day window, right? Yeah. I wait six hours or so. I don't take anything, it starts to hurt again. I take another 100 milligram dose, and within 15 minutes, my thumb doesn't hurt. Yeah. I'm like, well, it's awfully hard when I don't want it to work, right? To say it just didn't, it did. Yeah. So that was, that was June 4th, 2019. I did some experiments on dosing instructions. So I was taking 300 milligrams a day, and I'm like, how do I know that's not too much? Right, I reduced it to, 75, uh, to 50, and 80% of the pain was gone. I, I do another month at 75, that was the number for me, okay. right? So I take 75 three times a day. And in that time, it dawned on me, I'd suffered from migraines for 30 years. I would have them twice or three times a month like clockwork. I haven't had a migraine since June 4, 2019. I haven't had a headache. Even when I reduced the dosage to 50 milligrams, nothing. Man. I, you know, and I was shocked. So, you know, the children's hospital is working on that in Milwaukee. Uh, I have passed along all of our data on dosing um, because that's really where our industry is messed up too. Um, we don't have good dosing instructions. And individually, people are unique. All right, some people are super sensitive. Some people aren't. The majority of us fall in the center, yeah. right? And, and I think if we, if we can help put together dosing instructions kind of based on the type of pain or problem you're having, it'll help. Because then a lot of people that try CBD, they go, hey, this doesn't work. It's because the dose was wrong or the frequency was wrong. Yeah. Well, that was actually, you brought up dosing earlier and I wanted to make sure to revisit it just because that is one of the biggest issues. Uh, and, you know, it's not just, it's an issue because it's a threat to brands, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if the consumer experience isn't uh, uniform or um, consistent, yeah. you know, they're gonna lose customers. Absolutely. And, you know, that's something that you guys can help prevent. Absolutely. The, uh, one of the big advantages of this technology is because small doses act like, people that use this, and we have anecdotal stories, and I mean, there's hundreds of them. And what I'll tell you as a scientist is anecdotal evidence is evidence, especially in mass. If you don't believe me, then you don't believe that the Amazon review system works. <laughs> okay, because that's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. And what, what we have found is a constant trend of it worked fast and it lasted longer. Well, I can explain both of those in physics, all right? Regardless of body chemistry and my lack of biological knowledge, right? I can tell you that nanoparticulates get into you faster, your liver cannot filter them, so if there's no room at the time in your cannabinoid receptors, it's gonna hang out until there's an empty spot, which explains the lasting longer, right? Small particles are dissolved faster, so if you take it orally, right, there's more stomach acid that surrounds a small particle than a group of larger particles. Uh, if I add to that, that, you know, that first layer of digestion in your stomach is fat first, right? Our body stores that, right? Because that's what we need. It, it's in quick, you know. What, what are your expectations for American extractions? What are your plans to, uh, you know, for the business going forward? I, I, we want to, well, so now that the process works, if you ask me, and this is what's really hard. As a scientist, I can do it better always. But there is a point where you should say good enough is good enough. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm know? sure scope creep keeps you up at night it, all day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really yeah. does. It's that kind of thing. And unplugging from that, CBD has helped with, honest to God. Like, I have, I have not slept this good in my lifetime, and, and I can let things go for the first time in my life, which is fantastic, you know? So I thank George for that. Yeah, I can um, appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as we move forward, I want to deploy this technology against other compounds. And then further, I want to learn what these other cannabinoids do. Uh, so there's 16 of them there that George has uncovered, right? Maybe they do nothing. Right? Or maybe they do. Yeah, I mean, all the other ones that have been uncovered seem to do something. It, it seems unlikely. Well, look at this. So I, 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 THC, CBD are identical to each other, right? Does THC do something to you? Well, then why wouldn't CBD? It's made up of the same material, same boiling point, same molecules, slightly different order, that's it. One definitely reduces anxiety, allows you to relax and can relieve pain, and the other one has some euphoric feelings tied to it amongst other things. And I think what we're seeing too 
Like as an example, if, if people have smoked pot and their eyes got red, why? Or when you got munchies, why? Those are those minor cannabinoids working. The question is, which ones? Yeah. And in what amount? So there, and, and if, I, if my eyes are bloodshot, that means I've increased blood flow to my eye. So as we look at these things that are happening, there may be some value in increasing the blood flow in spaces that these minor cannabinoids can be used for. Right on. Um, that's really interesting. I never really thought about that uh, aspect of how it could be used. Um, Absolutely. I mean, but I guess that's just how your brain works. It, it is, it is. So we're, right now, we have started to understand the science. Yeah. This nucleates too fast. Shouldn't do that. In fact, I, I brought a guy in that wrote a, his dissertation on crystalline structures, and he goes, yeah, it can't do that. And I went, yeah, I know, <laughs> you know but it is, so why, right? Uh, and so this, this is that journey that's really fun. You, we are unwrapping new science, trying to get our hands around it, um, and then seeing how that is useful in making other products. So as you're, un you're unwrapping new tech, new science, what are you looking for in terms of a customer? Are you looking for farmers? Are you looking for people that are looking to manufacture gummies and other products? Who are you looking for as potential clients and, uh, and how would that work best for you? Yeah, so I'm looking for everything you just said, okay. right? Including the end user. So in, in my head, I, I work, I always, I'm dyslexic. I work backwards, right? Mm -hmm. So I think first and foremost, I want to deliver the single best product to the end user that I can. Because that end user is my wife, mm -hmm. right? It, it, look at the difference it made. Yeah. So I'm looking for people that are on a mission here, right? That we can partner with. Uh, you can make exceptionally clean, good tasting, right? Taste wins. Our gummies are amazing. Because like, if you cut them open, the people go, there's seeds in them. I'm like, yeah, it's because we use fruit. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's those little things that matter. And, and I think if you wrap up really good quality stuff, and then it works, all of those objections people have go away. Well, and, uh... and then deliver it in lots of fashions. We tabletize. Mm -hmm. And I t we tabletize because the guy's my age. Mm -hmm. Right? I was told anything good comes in a tablet, take your tablet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and that's not weird. Mm -hmm. Putting oil under my tongue. And I make it, it's weird, yeah. a little weird, you know? Uh, so I want to deliver the CBD or THC in a fashion that is most non-upsetting yeah. to the end user. And then once they see it works, maybe they go, you know, try that tincture, maybe I'll try that gummy, or maybe, I'll, you know. Well, you raise a good point because for certain people, you know, a tablet's not drugs. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, and for people that- It looks that's much- I agree. No, but like people, some people just can't wrap their head around that like, it's a, you know, it's a drug bat, you know, but you know, maybe that'll help with the, tear down the stigma a little bit. It will. I, and I think people need to unwind that, you know, um, the, the war against drugs wasn't, all of it wasn't a good idea and it didn't happen to make people safer. Not everything, right? You know, hemp, hemp was removed. Wisconsin was one of the major producers in the thirties, right? DuPont wanted the rope contract for the U.S. Navy for its new nylon product. So they had hemp moved from where it was into a Schedule One product, and they got the pro and they got the contract for all those rope sales. So I mean, this was a conglomeration of reasons, and then I, you know there were forces from the outside pushing in. The, obviously, the hemp lobby wasn't good in the '40s. <laughs> you know, not as good as some of these large companies that had interests in making money. The great part of being here now is we know more. We can't be fooled quite so easily all the time, anyway. Well, and so when you're talking about some of your products, is that because you white label stuff, you actually do some manufacturing Absolutely. Here. Yeah. yeah, we formulate and, and we formulate, we have a, a topical foam product instead of a cream, although we can do creams. Creams are just messy. Um, we've got, you know, lots of different oral products in lots of different flavors, all with the whole spectrum. So you get, you get a nano ionized product with all in organic ingredients that tastes good or feels good or... Uh, again, if you bring, if you if you can deliver the CBD in a fashion that's accepted, more people will do it, and then they'll see. I mean, they'll see the difference. I had the head of a science department from a large pharmacy in the United States who had been had a back injury, neck injury, and uh, had been absent from the office. He was looking at our project. He's like, "Wow, you're the first scientist we've talked to, really." I'm like, that's great. And uh, so we gave him some of our stuff. And he wrote me a letter saying, hey, I, I, I can attend meetings now. I tried CBD from another source. Yeah. It did not work. He was, and he works as a, in the pharmacy right, world. Yeah. And he goes, your stuff did. You gave me my life back. 
uh, you know. And so what's been great is we've had knowledgeable people look at the space and go, this does make a difference. Okay, and that's the difference between, that's why people should look for whole spectrum. Absolutely, yeah. You, okay. You're getting everything. Well, that wraps up the conversation with John Gepard. Again, thank you very much, John, and the entire team at American Extractions for inviting the Cannabis Equipment News team to your facility. We really did find it enlightening and really enjoyed our time there. Also, a reminder to anybody else in the area or anybody listening to this, if you'd like Cannabis Equipment News to potentially come out, do a live interview from the facility, as well as shoot the podcast or any kind of video, you can always reach me at david at CannabisEquipmentNews.com. All right, before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive re review on whatever platform you use. Finally, like I said, you can email the podcast, especially with an invitation to your facility, at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com. Almost forgot my email there. I know, it's embarrassing. All right, well, thanks again to John. I'm David Manti. This is the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast.